Professor Bullock is going to be our first speaker. He's at Columbia University, and he has three degrees from Harvard. And would you please come up and um, we'll let you start. As I said, I'm going to be very succinct and laconic with respect to the introduction. This guy is famous. We're lucky to have him. We want to focus on what he has to say and some Q&A opportunities. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be invited to speak at this event. Um, is there a breakthrough on the horizon for US and Iran direct talks? I have no idea. Uh, and so thank you very much. <laughs> um, if you invite a historian, uh, you can't be surprised when you get a history lesson. So I'm going to talk a bit about, about history. Uh, people often uh, ponder the question of uh, whether history moves faster in our times than it has in the past. And most people will say yes, because they'll say, well, planes go faster, and instantaneous communication, and so forth. And I take the opposite view. I say if there is a measure of history that you can have that is a constant measure, it's the human lifespan. Because uh, you may be able to go from, uh, you know, L.A. to Tehran in just a few hours, actually more than a few, um, but you, those hours are every bit as long, uh, and uh, your lifetime is, is the measure. And this is important because in historical change, what really is important to look at is the cycling through of generations. There are people who were socialized or politicized or <clears throat> otherwise drawn into a particular historical nexus uh, come to the end of their careers and uh, they are succeeded by other people who did not have those same experiences. Uh, I'm very interested in the question of comparative revolutions and what happens uh, with the revolution, with the passage of time. And one of the things that I uh, am struck by is that when you get to the time when the revolutionary generation is at retirement age, uh, things will change. And frequently the people who are at retirement age will do their damnedest to keep them from changing. But they're going to change anyway, because the people who are coming next don't share that, uh, that background. So now we have an Islamic Republic of Iran. It is basically 35 years old. Between now and when it is 40, uh, we're going to see a very significant turnover of personalities of people who are considered to be players as opposed to people who are thought of as um, you know, men of the past generation. Uh, some things we already know are going to be important, such as the, uh, the demographic bulge that uh, has produced a very, very large youth generation in Iran, which will not be a youth generation in 10 years. It will be a takeover generation. Uh, we already know that the majority of the university students in Iran are female, uh, and that Iran has a higher level of uh, female literacy than uh, many countries in the Arab world, because uh, unexpectedly, the policies of the Islamic Republic of Iran which is notoriously misogynistic in most readings, have created the, uh, the basis <laughs> for a great expansion of the, uh, of the talents of or the opportunities for women uh, in Iran. It would be uh, naive to think that the youth generation and the shift in gender uh, significance will not play an important role. But the question is, who will negotiate that role, and how will that be manifested 
in institutional and policy terms. And that, of course, has to do with the, uh, the turnover of your uh, the gatekeepers, the elites, the people who are at the top of the, uh, of the political uh, and institutional apparatus. It is often, I, I have heard many criticisms of the Islamic Republic of Iran over the last 35 years, as all of you, as all of you had, have. Uh, I have consistently, uh, since before the revolution began, considered uh, the Iranian uh, religious political uh, experiment be one of the great experiments of modern times. One of the ones that will have elements of success, elements of failure, but cannot be ignored uh, because it is uh, a an experiment that ran from the very beginning counter to what political scientists and sociologists had assumed would be the nature of revolutions. They had assumed that revolutions would be what they called progressive. Um, they had assumed that revolutions uh, would, uh, would be secular. It turned out it didn't happen that way, at least not in the way that was anticipated. I would argue that, in fact, uh, elements that are or can be progressive, uh, such as changes in uh, gender uh, roles and so forth, uh, are there in the Islamic Republic. And I also think that it is uh, clear that there is a uh, current of secularization going on in the Islamic Republic. Uh, but given the uh, a kind of a time warp between the dominant uh, figures and the, uh, the people who are going to make the changes uh, over the next uh, 5 to 15 years, uh, we don't yet see exactly how this is going to work out. This is normal. This is what happens in revolutions. So let me talk to you a bit about uh, what happened. Uh, 35 years after the beginning of the American Republic. Um, George Washington becomes president in 1789. So you go 35 years and you have the election of 1824. Uh, and the election of 1824 was considered by many people at the time to be a stolen election um, where devious backroom deals prevented the rightful man from becoming president and put the wrong man in his place because of a rigged vote. Uh, now we never talk about this because this is the era of the founding founding fathers. We idolize the founding fathers. We think that they must have been wonderful, wonderful political figures. In fact, they were uh, really marginally competent in many ways. So what happened in 1824? you had basically five people who were uh, eligible, that is to say, who had been uh, identified by uh, caucuses within the Congress to be candidates for president. You didn't have parties. All these people ran on the same party. Um, you didn't have primaries. You didn't have conventions. You simply had a caucus within the Congress to decide who should run for president. Uh, that caucus, I think they called the Guardian Council? No, no, maybe, uh, maybe they called it something else. It's just a bad recollection on my part. But the thing is, it, it wasn't a, a system where, where uh, there would be sort of grassroots organizations that would choose the person who should run for president. It was all set up internally. So you had five people. You had John Quincy Adams, who thought he deserved it because his father had been president. You had Andrew Jackson, the hero of War of 1812. You had Henry Clay, uh, John C. Calhoun, and William Crawford. Now, who remembers William Crawford? But uh, normally, the candidates for president at that time were cabinet members, and Crawford was a member of the cabinet. And uh, that's what brought them to the attention 
of the congressional caucuses because every uh, every cabinet of uh, ministry had a uh, corresponding role to play in the Congress, as opposed to the president, who had almost no connection with Congress at all. Uh, presidents did not give speeches to Congress, they did not present legislation. They sat in the White House, and the road from the Capitol to the White House was virtually untrodden. Of course, it was a swamp, but that's the second point. Um, so you had these guys who had their, their cliques in Congress who pushed them for the nomination. John C. Calhoun realized that he didn't have a chance. So he withdrew, and he became the vice presidential running mate of two of the other candidates. He was running on two tickets, out of, or two tickets, so to speak. It was only one party. Uh, so then you had the vote. Uh, the vote was won by Andrew Jackson. Uh, he had a plurality of 41%. Uh, John Quincy Adams had 39%. And then you had smaller numbers, much smaller numbers, for William Crawford and uh, uh, the other one. Henry Clay. Henry Clay, right. So, uh, the Twelfth Amendment Constitution has specified that if you have a failure in the Electoral College to get a majority, then they must vote again among the top, the top three finishers. So that meant that three people, uh, Crawford, John Quincy Adams, and Andrew Jackson, uh, were going to be the finalists, which left Henry Clay um, uh, out of the running, although he had uh, substantial support. Uh, so then what happens is that uh, uh, Henry Clay's people go to support John Quincy Adams, and promptly John Quincy Adams, after being elected, names uh, Henry Clay as Secretary of State. Um, and this was seen by the Jackson people as a deal. It was simply a blatant theft of the election. Jackson should have won. He had carried half the states whereas John Quincy Adams had carried only a third of the states. Uh, and so it was a stolen election. And Andrew Jackson was extremely irate and talked about this great scandal. Well, over time, uh, as we all know, our presidential nomination and electoral system became perfect. <laughs> um, and we no longer had stolen elections or irregularly nominated candidates or backroom deals, or special log rolling uh, arrangements between potential candidates who would uh, turn over their supporters to someone else. Well, we got rid of all that. But there at the beginning, 35 years after the founding, uh, our system was not a perfect, uh, a perfect democracy. Um, when we look forward to a presidential election in Iran, uh, it would be uh, foolish to think that you're going to get a perfect democracy in Iran. You know, if the Islamic Republic lasts long enough, say it lasts as long as our democracy has, then it will become perfect. We know this that's what history dictates. Uh, but, um, but things are still in, a early system, in an early stage in terms of the evolution of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And the anger or uh, anxiety you see so often expressed by Americans and other observers about how the Iranian system is not truly democratic, not perfect, not, uh, and maybe it's rigged, or even worse, maybe it's not rigged, um, and so forth. Uh, that's normal for a polity at the stage of development that the IRI is at, and it was normal uh, for our republic. In fact, to make a comparison, uh, the IRI probably works better than the United States of America did, uh, say, between the end of Thomas Jefferson's administration and the end of John Quincy Adams' administration, which was a <coughs> period of sort of uh, desolate uh, political <coughs> leadership in the United States. So 
I think that people who have a, a rather short uh, time horizon, looking back or looking forward, often uh, leap to conclusions, rush to judgment, and say things are going to happen in a certain way when they aren't. What's going to happen is something that we cannot predict exactly, but what is going to happen is that over the next few years we're going to see a turnover of people, and those people uh, are the people who will be involved in direct Iran-U.S. talks if those should gradually be achieved. Uh, how would that look from a from a U.S. perspective? I mean, from an Iranian perspective, obviously some people see a greater desirability to have such talks than others do. But we have a lot of misinterpretation, I think, of the American perspective. Uh, keep in mind, no one under the age of 45 remembers Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, no one in that age category, which includes all of our high school and college students, graduate students, uh, assistant professors, nobody actually remembers the hostage crisis. Uh, nobody remembers um, uh, the Shah of Iran. Uh, it's all history for them. And the one thing I know after 45 years of teaching history is that students don't learn anything. Uh, and therefore, if it's history, they probably don't learn it. So what is Iran for these uh, Americans who, over the next five to ten years, will become our takeover generation? Uh, Iran is uh, an anti-Israeli state. Uh, Iran is a country with nuclear ambitions. Iran is a country whose current president is considered kind of a make fun of figure for many Americans. Uh, is Iran seen as a threat to the United States? I don't think it is. I think that the uh, the rhetoric surrounding the nuclear and uh, Israel issues has created a um, an, uh, an illusion that some people buy into and other people do not. And the reason I say this, a year or two ago, a CNN reporter came to my office to do a little uh, television interview, a real quickie, and said, okay, set up, stand there, and there's cameras on. Um, uh, how much of a danger is Iran to the United States? I said, zero. Iran is not a danger to the United States. And she started not pleasant. No, that's not an answer I can have. <laughs> um, I need to know how much. I said, yes, you need to know that the answer is zero. It may be a threat to somebody. That's not a threat to the United States. And you should not be, be telling people that. Uh, so the effort to, uh, to portray Iran in this way, I think, um, is there. I think it is not selling terribly well. That's the reason I think that we have a, a popular mood that would be willing to entertain direct talks. Um, but what could be done to to help. Uh, one thing is a peculiarity about Persian language. Uh, if you want to say, down with something, <laughs> you say, matter bad something. Matter bad America, death to America. Matter bad Israel, death to Israel. Matter bad or bad hedge Death to the woman who's letting her hair show because she wears a bad hijab. And so you say, well, why don't they say down with instead of death to? Oh, today I was asking a really brilliant specialist, uh, an Iranian specialist on Iranian language, literature, history, and said, how do you say down with in Persian? Um, what's the alternative to death to? He said, uh, you can't. 
it's kind of death to or nothing. It's, it's, it's what you say. And then my friend who was at the table, and who's a specialist in Turkey, was saying, I don't think we can say Dalmuth in Turkish. And uh, it was pointed out that during the revolution, when people were saying, Mary Bar America, death to America, you had posters in English that were saying, down with America. Because that's what it means. And yet, one of the peculiar things that Americans uh, associate with Iran is big crowds of people saying, death to America. I think, well, supposing you had big crowds of Americans saying death to Iran, that would be a sea change in world politics. Because we have the alternative, we can say down with. <laughs> and I think one of the things I'd like to see is uh, candidates for president in the upcoming election in Iran to say that they will declare a moratorium on anyone in an official position saying man, bear, and recall. It's time to get rid of the idea that death to is a acceptable uh, locution in international affairs, particularly between countries that have as much in common and as much you know, as many important things to talk about as Iran and the United States. And what I think is the case is that the Iranian officialdom doesn't realize because they think they're saying down with. And it's translated by CNN and others, Fox News, as death to. So, you know, it's, it's an atmospheric thing, but I think that atmospherics count at this particular juncture, where there is a possibility of movement. But you need to have something that becomes visible and means something, even if it's meaningless. And I think that if you had a, a moratorium declared on that uh, silly locution, as minor as it is, I think that would have an impact. And I think it would get reported. And I think that people would feel, oh, things are improving with Iran. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.